All right, today I'm joined by Sharik Sheikh, and Sharik is the founder of Clever X, a platform that powers market research teams by providing them with access to the tools and hardest to reach commercial audiences. The company's platform allows users to build a network with business professionals and fellow entrepreneurs via video calls, enabling entrepreneurs to avail expert advice and grow their businesses. Um, I'm going to be taking a much deeper look at it after, we're co- after we come off of this call. Um, before becoming a tech entrepreneur, Sharik worked with Gartner, uh, and many of you obviously will be familiar with them, but they're considered to be the top technology research organization in the world. He assisted them in developing initiatives that enable technology leaders from many industries to work together in a secure environment. So welcome to the podcast, Shark. Thank you so much for having me, Paul. Pleasure to be here. All right, let's start with something nice and easy. What gave you the idea for CleverX? Uh, that's, uh, yeah, that's, that's a pretty good question. I think uh, it all started when I was working with Gartner. And uh, as you rightly mentioned, it's one of the most uh, you know leading technology research companies. And we had access to some incredible people uh, you know, who were analysts at Gartner. And the job is to work with CIOs or CTOs and head of technology departments in the largest companies, governments all around the world and help them make informed decisions about investments in technology. But the big component of of their value proposition is also research. So Gartner does a lot of research where they conduct online surveys, you know, connect with uh, very senior business professionals to get their insights. And then they translate all of that into trends and, um, you know, different research methods and pass on those findings to their customers. Customers use those findings to make those decisions, right? So imagine, if you're a CIO of a bank, you would want to know what other banks or their CIOs are thinking about investing in the next two to five years. So it just gives you a good picture in the future and you can make decisions based on that. For me, that was very intriguing. I've never heard of Gartner before, before I joined Gartner, right? I, I didn't know what they were doing, right? So I was getting ready for the, you know, the interview process and things. And then I just entered into a world where, um, I could see, you know, how research market research really works. Uh, I come from a technology background, so I'm a software engineer by trade. So for me, um, th- that was like a learning where how could I bring, you know, technology and market research together? And we wanted to make sure that uh, when 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 I wanted to start CleverX, the idea was Gartner is great, but it's it's only you know it can only be used by the top three to five percent companies in the world who can afford Gartner, right? Mm-hmm. But the rest of the world does things on LinkedIn, right? So if you want to conduct an online survey, you go on LinkedIn and find those 100 people that you want to, you know, uh, interview in in an online survey or, you know, conduct qualitative calls with them or research interviews. So there was really no good way of doing it. Um, uh, And and the, the way things are done in the market research industry, especially when it comes to business to business market research, has not changed in the last 50 years. Uh, And we wanted to bring a new novel approach to it. So we built a platform which looks very much like LinkedIn with thousands of senior business professionals on it, people who work at the White House to people who work at Apple. Um, And you have the ability to directly connect with them and engage with them for research purposes. Uh, And I think that, that, that giving that platform to people who can't afford a company like Gartner or McKinsey, you know, in consulting would was our our segue into that space so we 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 are kind of somewhere in between rather than you trying to use linkedin to do it which is not the best experience i'm sure a lot of your audience would understand what i'm talking about because if you reach out to 20 people on linkedin there's a the the chance of getting one acknowledge there's a chance of only getting one acknowledgement out of 20 emails that you sent that's Mm -hmm. actually legit numbers you know if you run experiments um, and then on the other side, you can't afford a company like Gartner to conduct research or a big, large enterprise market research company. So we wanted to give something in the middle and where even smaller researchers, you know, small research firms or, you know, an individual market researcher can come to the platform and conduct the research process instantly rather than relying on third parties to get that work done. So it's been a pretty exciting journey for us in the last three years. The company has grown its revenues by leaps and bounds uh, in multi-million dollars. Uh, and uh, we have some of the largest, uh, you know, brands uh, research power through our platform from Google to TikTok to Twitters in technology or research companies like Ipsos, Kantar, um, you know, those companies use CleverX to conduct research. Yeah. Fascinating. I know that this is a field that is really starting to 
um, to heat up a little bit. Um, and we've, you know, for years and years and years, there's been uh, consumer based research and it's a very uh, mature field, but yeah. the, the whole business to business research um, is something that is a, re is a relatively new field. So that leads me to kind of my second question, which is that um, let's say that you've got uh, an individual who's trying to, trying to use your platform and they've got a specific set of questions that they need answered. Um, how, are you, how are you helping them get the answers to those questions as quickly and as efficiently as they could possibly can? Yeah, that's a very, very interesting question. Um, the, the, the biggest thing that we learned while building this company, a lot of people in your audience probably wouldn't know this. Almost 40% of the data that a company, a research company gets out of an online survey is fraudulent. Mm -hmm. And this is not us saying this, this is SMR, which is one of the largest, you know, um, nonprofit organization in the market research space has analyzed multiple data points to figure that out. Now, when, um, you know, people come to a platform, usually they already, you know, they, they've already programmed a survey or they've already thought about whom they want to interact with. What happens is when you, when you go on the platform, you can very transparently know real identities of professionals and you know whom you're going to talk to be the qualitative research interview. So people usually have that information already in place, like what are the questions I'm going to ask? But there's a chat feature on our platform, which is free, by the way, for every user so they can connect with each other. And they would generally ask those questions in the chat, like, hey, I have these five questions about this topic. I know you work for this company. Would like to pick your brains on it. And that person might respond back to you and say, like, hey, I can answer three questions. The other two questions probably are not uh, something that I'm great at, you know, giving you insights about. But at least you get into a conversation with a set expectation. When you use the other alternatives, like the expert networks, you don't even know whom you're talking to. So there's no visibility on the person that you're going to be connected to. And you don't get the ability to ask questions before you interact with them. So that's a very different industry altogether when it comes mm -hmm. to, um, you know, video or research interviews. On the other side, which is these online surveys, um, people usually, uh, our, our tool is very, um, or the platform is very tool agnostic. What I mean by that is you can program a survey on Caltrix or on Confirm it or Four Star. These are large online survey creation tools. And you can just directly connect it to the audience on our platform. So we are like an audience discovery platform. So you can bring your survey connected to the audience, a known audience, and you know exactly whom you're going to um, ask to participate in an online survey, which doesn't happen in the traditional world today. Mm -hmm. So even the researcher doesn't know who's taking which survey. So when you go to your customer or your board to share that information, saying like, I got this out of... I, uh, you know, 500 CIOs who have given me this response, you have no idea, are they really those 500 CIOs that you got sold for, right? And that's the problem we're trying to solve. So going back to the, the question about how do we help them, we are building this, uh, we're getting into the segue around AI now, where the AI would be able to look at your project and mm -hmm. give you or throw up some questions to say like, hey, did you incorporate these questions mm -hmm. uh, in your research you know, in an online survey or in your video interviews that you're going to do. What are the questions that are good? What are bad? So things like that are going to become a norm in the market research space. Uh, already companies like Qualtrics are working on it where you program a survey. Let's say you're doing a survey for truckers, right? Just a random example. What are the kind of questions you should ask? So they've got all this data for decades probably, and they're going to use that data to recommend certain questions. So the job of the market researcher becomes easier to put those questions or improve on their questions in that online survey. So I think we're heading into this direction where these systems will recommend and suggest you a lot of things uh, that could make your job faster and easier. And even the quality of the, the insights might improve out of that. Yeah, you're touching on an area that I actually want to go into a little bit more deeply, which is what what constitutes reliable data, right? You, yeah. you, you talked about one aspect of that, which is, yeah. um, which is talking to people that are actually real people. I think that yeah. statistic will surprise, um, will surprise and alarm, <laughs> alarm yeah. quite a lot of people. Funnily enough, it's a stat that I just heard a couple of, uh, couple of weeks ago, but it surprised and alarmed me when I heard it. 
Um, and so that's one aspect of it. But to me, when I think of reliable data, I'm not just thinking about whether it's the genuine answer of genuine people. What I'm thinking about is almost like the, like, is it useful, actionable data? In a sense, is it, is it something I can rely on to help me make business decisions? So when you think about reliability from that, from that perspective, what do you believe constitutes reliable data that I can actually act upon? See, there are two ways to, to look at insights. That's why you have the qualitative and the quantitative methods. Um, when you want to go deeper on a specific topic with a few individuals, uh, and that's your goal of getting an insight. So let's say you have an understanding of a particular, let's say you, you're trying to understand what is hype versus reality in the world of AI. Mm -hmm. You're a researcher, you want to figure that out. What you want to, you, you'll have like some basic information about what are the things that are applicable in that world of AI that is happening right now. Like what can ChatGPT do versus what it cannot do. You have a basic understanding. What you want to do is talk to 10 people who are working with OpenAI or similar companies to understand what's hype versus what reality, what is wishful thinking, what is actually possible by this technology to accomplish in the next two to five years. So you do those interviews to get very specific insights, go deeper on that topic. When you're looking at um, collective intelligence, which is like a bunch of people, hundreds of people, how do they think or what direction they're thinking into, that's when you get into quantitative. So for example, I want to know what does the sentiment look like for the SMB sector in the US in 2024? What are like the senior execs in the SMBs are thinking about business around risk and revenues and growth? Um, you want to do an online survey because that gives you a good indication. So even if like an individually one person's data is not that reliable, the overall collection is a good indicator for you to find that reliability in making that decision. And I think that's a huge distinction when you're trying to do a project or when you want to decide what path to take. How do you deal um, with, I don't know, the, the hum human nature, cognitive, uh, I mean, broadly captured as, co as cognitive biases, I guess you could call it. Yeah. Um, I've been thinking about this quite a lot recently because we had um, uh, just very recently um, on our podcast, um, we had a, a guest, uh, Zach Ratner. Mm -hmm. and, um, and Zach was, was talking about, at one, at one point we were talking to him about how you go about gaining or understanding negative sentiment, negative sentiment towards a, a product or a service, mm -hmm. right? Really hard to do. And one of the reasons that it's really hard to do is because the vast majority of people, if you, you, if you ask them for sentiment, they don't want to tell you that your idea sucks, right? It's the calling right. your baby ugly problem, right? It's, yeah. <laughs> so they don't, they don't want to look you in the face and tell you that they think your idea is really stupid. There's very pe yeah. few people that will do that. And in fact, in many cases, the collection of people that will do that are people that have a strong bias themselves towards providing negative feedback. Whereas there's a whole group of other people out there that might think your idea sucks, but you're never going to hear it. You're never going to know about it. Yeah. Um, and so Zach proposes some, some techniques, but I'm, I'm curious as to how you're dealing with the fact that ultimately you're dealing with a collection of, of human beings and that, yeah. and that set of human beings are going to be wired in a certain way in terms of the type of feedback they're likely to give you versus the type of feedback they're likely to hold back. Is that around yeah. how you frame questions? What, what is it exactly? Yeah, I think uh, one way I've seen research companies do that is, um, let's say they conduct an online survey too, and they want to make sure that they're not going to fall, fall into the trap of cognitive bias. Mm -hmm. uh, they repeat questions, but they frame it differently multiple times. Mm -hmm. So what they want to do is like ask you the same question in two or three different ways within the same survey. And if that is consistent across those two, three times that you've been asked that question, they know that you genuinely have... a uh, uh, you know, a feedback that you are sure about and you're not just saying something because it hit you in, in a certain way, like one question. So they try to validate in multiple questions, uh, but just framing them differently and get inference out of it. That is one way that I've seen market researchers do that. There's also another statistic, which I think was from Nielsen, if I'm not mistaken, so don't quote me for it. But um, when you get one wrong bad feedback, there are seven other people apparently who feel the same. 
they just mm-hmm. don't want to talk about it or they don't want to like they don't have the time to tell you like your product is bad or your baby is ugly right mm-hmm. um, so it takes like eight people there are eight bad ex- uh, experiences for that one experience bad experience that you got so i think brands should care about those kind of statistics as well to know like it's not just this one single person there's probably another seven eight people out there who also feel wrong about this this situation or this experience of this product right um, but i think asking multiple questions reframing them differently would be a good way to get the cognitive bias out i've also realized one thing biases are not just based on human beings as as an entire race it also changes based on the kind of people that you're working with interesting so what i mean by that when you talk to when you conduct a survey with like very senior business professionals you don't want that survey to go beyond 10 to 15 minutes mm-hmm. the longer it goes the questions answers to those questions start turning to be negative because they're already they're losing the temperament of being in that service for a longer time uh, and it could be different for students versus it could be different for housewives and it could be very different for execs so it's mm-hmm. very interesting the kind of people that you're also surveying or trying to do research on um, their day-to-day life how busy they are how frustrating those jobs are there are multiple reasons uh you know that that bias can come from multiple you know different directions yeah all right one last question on that and in terms of like trying to trying to eliminate the biases um when i used to work at microsoft um, we did a lot of, um, in a couple of the groups that I was in, we did a lot of, um, of outreach to develop, to the developer community. And this is yeah. like prior to things like Stack Overflow and stuff like that. Right. Um, as, as we were doing that, um, we gathered terrific data, or at least we thought that was terrific data that really was started to guide, um, the content that we were producing. Um, and about six months later, what we found is that having acted upon all of this and having reconfigured how we, what we produced and how we produced it, um, that the overall uptake of what we were, uh, of what we were producing was going down fairly dramatically. Mm-hmm. And this took us a while to figure out. And what we ultimately figured out was that um, the nature of the people that were talking to us defined them as a, as a group. In other words, there was a, there was already a bias, a very significant bias in terms of when you reached out to people and they actually responded, they were reflecting a small subset of developers who responded to these types of questions. And, uh, and so we went on this quest, um, which I think we were probably slightly successful at, but not yeah. completely successful at, to try to find what I like to call the silent voices or the hidden voices or something like that. So I would imagine this is a problem in almost all uh, realms like this. How do you go about addressing whether the, the, the potential bias of the only people you hear from are the people that are willing to talk to you? Yeah, uh, it's, it's, it's a very interesting question. I don't think there is a perfect way to do that. I don't think any company will can very confidently say that we could, we are in a position to remove bias, right? But mm-hmm. uh, now, now with, with technology improving so much, um, there are two kinds of feedback that you can get. And I can speak specifically from a qualitative standpoint, which, which we are seeing in the, in the space a lot. So you can answer a question to me on this video. I can answer back a question to you. Mm-hmm. But how's my, how, how's my body language? How am I responding? Like, so the, the softer body language behavior, my expressions or micro expressions are actually being taken care of uh, in, in those qualitative interviews as well as a part of an finding you know how do you feel when you say a certain word be positive or negative uh things of that sort so they're they're getting into these weeds of uh, body language micro expressions to get give that feedback which is not just reliant on my words which is one way of input of my findings to you so we're seeing that uh but uh, uh my question to you i'm really curious to know when you did this developer outreach did you know individually who these people were uh we did Okay. And that's, um, and so that ultimately that ended up being part of our solution. And I think you've hinted on elements of it, right? Yeah. When you were talking about like qualitative versus quantitative and things like that, right? Yeah. I'll briefly, I'll say what we found, right? So what we yeah. found was that when you reach out to certain people in a certain way, 
like for yeah. example through user groups or whatever the people that are prepared to put the time in to participate in the in the user group they're wired in a certain way they're excited by what you're already doing they are willing to put in the time investment maybe if you you know work at a company like microsoft maybe they want to join microsoft someday yeah. right yeah. and so there's a whole bunch of different like motive motivations yeah. that they yeah. have and that that alters their feedback so for example as a classic example we're just talking about negative feedback right in most cases right if i'm responding to a to a survey from you and or, or on a user group with you and my ultimate goal is to work for you someday You're i'm not that it. likely to, to say i think everything you do sucks and <laughs> <laughs> you know etc cetera, etc cetera. you're you're trying to convey a, po a positive impression right. associated with it and so what we found was number one ask questions in a in a bunch of different ways number two go through a variety of different forums and actually have even different styles in which you uh, in which you ask your questions and then as you do that start to analyze the differences between them yeah. and they at least give you clues as to how you can adjust for or adapt to the feedback that you're getting it kind of relates to what you said before about the negative feedback like you get some person one person who's prepared to put their head above the parapet parapet and say something yeah. negative that's probably a stronger signal than you would like to admit that it is yeah right? so yeah. it was it's it's those things that, again we never we never found a perfect answer answer to the solution but what we got better at was understanding what adjustments to make and what adaptations to make based on the feedback that we were getting yeah. versus just taking it as read that it was completely you know, yep. completely accurate. And of course, this, yeah. this, all elements of this are, are challenges right now. It's why opinion, you know, why opinion polls are, you know, have to be adjusted and adapted and all that kind of yes. stuff when we're looking at political opinions and things like that, because different yeah. groups of people will answer and some, and those, that groups of pe that group of people might have some other correlated collection of biases that, yes. that shift your data set ultimately. Yeah, yeah, no, you're, you're absolutely right. I, also, we've also learned that the incentivization that you do for uh -huh. new users could also impact the, the responses. Um, mm -hmm. So some people are incentivized by money. Some people are incentivized by a job that I might get a job at Microsoft in the future. Mm -hmm. Some people are also responding to based on how they're feeling on that day. Yeah. Like what's happening in their life on that day, right? So if you're in a good mood, usually your answers are not that bad, or you're not going to be so brutal to the to the survey. But maybe you're just in a bad mood. Your car broke down, you know, or or, or whatever. And people tend to do that. So yeah, you're right. Like there has to be at least ten to twenty percent of this like adjustment that needs to be done for those kind of respondents or participants. All right, let's shift to my my uh, hidden agenda on this pod. <laughs> so so one, of, one of the reasons that I really wanted to get you uh, to get you on the pod was um, that I'm really interested in how you take these same techniques that you're describing that your uh, that your organization offers and apply them as a lens within your own organization. Yeah. Um, so let's start by kind of understanding the backdrop to all of this. So what's your, what is your opinion as to how the world of work is even evolving at different levels within organizations right now? Yeah, I think, um, you know, there's a, there's, so we've got close to 20,000 users on the platform. Thousands mm -hmm. of people earn money in terms of millions of dollars every year through our platform. Right. And these are, people who are manager above positions so and to up to ceos of very large companies mm -hmm. what what we are learning or what we've learned in the last couple of years after and the time of covid and pandemic is like there's a lot of emphasis on the conversation around you know the location right i don't want to drive to work there's this um you know medical emergency so offices had to keep certain levels of standards when people come into the office be it like a co-working space or your actual office building a lot of companies laid off people they shut down offices so they, that everyone mm -hmm. can work from home i think the bigger trend that we noticed personally was not around just this whole physical logistical aspects of hybrid work or remote work that is a debatable thing and i think each company should find their own way of working and most of the companies would look like hybrid in that particular realm mm -hmm. i think the biggest trend that we see we are seeing is like people 
will do multiple jobs in a week, be it senior position people. We are seeing that a lot in HR space right now, and that will spill over to other you know job roles as well, where people are saying, you know what, what did COVID teach me? The most important thing was not just about working from home, but I can work for three to four days full time with one company and I can spend the other day doing things that I love doing. Or yeah. I can work with another company for a day or two, maybe consulting, advising them. It is not necessarily could be an HR work. It could be something totally different. That is a passion for that particular individual. Mm-hmm. So this could be a bold, bold prediction from my end. But I think in the next 10 to 20 years, you will see more people having multiple jobs uh, rather than the same one single job, nine to five, five days a week. It's going to yeah. look like maybe three days, one job, two days, another job. It could be three days, one full time, one job, and then one day each with other companies or with other things completely. And that is not driven by money, by the way. The other two are not driven by money. They're driven by your individual passions. Because now what it, what internet has done, which AI will also complement, is like your jobs are going to get easier and easier in the future, especially the mundane tasks that we do. And people are going to look forward towards how can I make my life more fulfilling because these mundane tasks are done by technology and I can focus on things which are that I enjoy. So we've seen that trend and I, I talk to hundreds of people, uh, you know, from our platform as well. I get that sense that people are moving in that direction. I think that's a bigger change in our workforce than anything else rather than the whole remote hybrid, where should we work, how much should I travel to work, you know? Yeah, we track this quite a lot. And I will say that um, you've up, <laughs> you've opened up an area that is, um, I think, increasingly well understood at senior levels inside some organizations, but that is an area of huge controversy um, for many individuals yeah. and for um, and actually for some uh, for some leaders in, inside organizations. And what it really comes down to is the fact that. While we are in the midst of a transition away from work happening for a certain number of hours and having a certain number of defined tasks associated with that work and towards work being um, measured by outcomes that are driven inside organizations, we are still in that transition, right? We haven't changed fully how people are rewarded. We haven't fully changed how, how these things are, are even measured. And here's where it gets really complicated, which is that the vast majority of us at any one time, at any point in time, have stuff, whether you can call it a to-do list or, you know, or something more, (laughs) more, uh, I don't know, sophisticated than that. Yeah. But we've always got more stuff we could be doing in our work than we have time to do it. Yep. And so given that, you can, you can see that why for some individuals and for some companies, like, well, hang on, what, you're spending like three, four days at my company and then you're going off for, I'm working for somebody else's company. Yeah. You've got six days to spare. I want those six days. Yeah. And so how do you reward that? How do you, um, you know, how do you handle that appropriately? I think is a really interesting question that a lot of companies have not fully resolved. And what we've seen is that, um, you know, um, and the way we look at this is we, you know, we, we monitor um, how this is um, tracked about and talked about on social media, but we also talk to leaders and we talk to employees about this, this challenge specifically. And what we see is a lot of, you know, fear, uncertainty, and doubt asso- uh, associated with this. And sometimes kind of, you know, a reasonable amount of, of anger, particularly lower down inside, inside organizations when they see people potentially at higher points in organizations like doing this. Right? Yeah. And, and so I think, there's, I think there's tension that has to be worked through um, in order for that to, uh, in order for that to, to fully um, become the norm. But I agree yeah. with you. I think that ultimately... We're going to get. We're going to get to a point where you're going to have a human um, who is determining where they're going to spend their time. To spend their time, 
Yeah. Use the old yeah. LeBron James, take their talents, yeah. you know, yeah. but they're going <laughs> to, but they're going to, they're going to spend their time in, in certain ways. And then there are going to be contractual relationships between those humans and the organizations for which that to which they are providing value. Yeah. And then that human is then going to have a, um, you know, is, is going to do enough of those in order to be able to make a living, but then also to fulfill themselves. Um, yeah. so that's probably where we're going to, uh, probably where we're going to end up, but it's going to be a long and bumpy road. I think, yes, uh, I think to get there. Yeah. You, uh, you remember the, uh, sorry to interrupt you. you no, 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 please the, go ahead. The Reddit post, it was very fascinating where this guy who's a software developer, I think somewhere in New York or Silicon Valley, who said that he's working for the top, you know, two tech companies at the same time, takes mm -hmm. away home like 400 K, but both the companies are not aware that he works for these two companies, mm -hmm. right? It's the same thing, right? Like, yep. If, if companies don't take a lead in managing these expectations or relationships or kind of like punish people for thinking that way, people are just going to be not honest about it and still do what they want to do. That's, yeah. that's how it's going to look like. Yeah. So with that as background, let's dive a little deeper into, into how you do go about um, understanding sentiment, how you go about understanding how... Uh, and the employee experience in a more effective way. Um, what do you think are the best ways to use the sorts of techniques that you're talking about to gather information about, uh, to gather information from employees? Now that could be information about what the employee, how the employees think the company should be run. Mm. It could be information about, um, or ideas or innovations that the employees might have, or it could just be, you know, sentiment of employees uh, and measuring engagement of employees. How, what do you think are the best ways to be able to gather that type of data? I think, you know, if people had the time, I, I wish, you know, HR department had more free, free time and free space to actually go and talk to people individually mm -hmm. and learn from them in a more qualitative way rather than just running surveys. Uh, people like you work for big companies. I work for big companies. When we get a survey, which is a mandatory survey, the last thing you want to do is take a survey yeah. about, and you want to go through it as quickly as possible, finish it so you can get to your work. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, but your HR department has asked you to take up that survey and you know, it's like, it's a compulsion. You've got to get it done. Uh, I think online surveys are a bad way to do that. This is my personal view. Uh, mm -hmm. and, a lot of people might not like it. I would rather want to go and talk to people on the front lines rather than asking their managers to tell you how the team is feeling. That's a bad way to, to do that again, even if you're doing it qualitatively. So mm -hmm. like talking to a, a leader who manages 20 people and asking them, how's your team doing? They're most likely going to give you an answer that they're doing great. They yeah. don't want to look bad. Mm -hmm. uh, like I'm not handling my team well. I think talking to people who are... Uh, at the ground level, you know, in the front lines, an HR team can probably do more qualitative discussions with them about how they feel, what are the problems, and bring that or surface that to the high, to the to the manager or to the top management is a better way to do it. That's how we do it in our company. Like I do monthly to you know forty five day check ins with every single person, even if they work with us for years, just to know how they feel um, mm -hmm. about working with us, what are the challenges they have, and let people have the ability let let people have the permission to speak their mind mm -hmm. like if you have this culture in a company it all comes down to culture at the end of the day uh where if you have this culture in the company that you're going to be punished for saying the truth of how you feel is is where people lie and they don't want to talk about things so yeah. that has to come from the top to bottom that's how it works so if i give people the liberty to speak their mind for how they feel about a certain thing that we're doing or me being a ceo of a company or how we should progress what should we look at in the year 2024 and and their opinions are at least heard if not implemented people are open to talk about it but they should not be they should have fear that if i answer a question about how i feel is is a is going to create a problem for me or you know come back to bite me later uh, those are the things I think companies should really be careful about rather than just running online. Because if you notice, uh, take a company's internal online survey about mm -hmm. how they feel about a CEO and then go and look at on Glassdoor, which is anonymous. It yeah. probably could contradict very, 
like to the next to, to a different spectrum altogether right so that 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 doesn't prove the point that both of them are correct it just proves a point that people are saying something else in a different environment versus your own environment and i think qualitative measures are better to do that and and having that culture to be okay to speak about things that those are two really important things i guess people should consider yeah yeah I'll, quickly let's delve in just a little bit on the qualitative versus quantitative thing because yeah. I, I i see i wouldn't say, possibly increasingly i don't know yeah. but you see a lot of companies trying to address the whole issue of survey fatigue and and uh you know and fatigue and assessments and you know the length of them and so on by mm. just zooming in on nps scores mm. um and using it for that uh, for that purpose so um brief well number one i guess we should very briefly explain what an nps score is i'll let you do that but then number two what do you think about trying to solve the problem of at least you know the surveys being long and cumbersome by replacing it with a simple measure like an NPS score? Yeah, I think NPS scores are good in certain scenarios. They're not bad, right? Like, for example, you're buying a product. So just for the audience, what is an NPS score is a net promoter score, uh, which usually companies use to know that are you going to use my product in the future again? Uh, that's an example from a product's perspective. So are you going to use my product uh, in the future again? And if your score is above eight, sometimes nine or 10, then I know that you're very highly likely to refer my product uh, with a word of mouth or you're going to buy or do a repeat you know, purchase of that product. Mm -hmm. If it is anything below eight, sometimes seven, depending on different products and services, people structure the NPS. If it's lesser, then you're not doing a great job. Right. Uh, but NPS scores are like an overall experience that you have with that company or the product. So it could be possible that uh, they are not the reflection of the entirety of the thing. For example, mm -hmm. I might really enjoy my iPhone, but mm -hmm. I had a really bad, horrible experience at the Apple store. Yeah. But for me, that's an entire experience. Mm -hmm. So I might rate Apple as six because yeah. on that day, my experience at the Apple store was bad but the product might be nine for me, right? Mm -hmm. So companies need to like really understand when they're like doing these NPS scores with, uh, with their employees to structure it in a way that they can cover all aspects of that experience and get different NPS scores around it and then have an aggregated you know, score for that particular individual. That, so it works, uh, but it could be misleading if you haven't done it well or done it properly. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Um, all right, let's finish off here. I don't know that. We just had uh, a, a certain uh, Amazon thing trying to listen to us, uh, listen into us there. Sorry about that. Uh, so let's <laughs> let's uh, let's finish off here. Um, we talked a lot about understanding um, sentiment, I suppose, and then also understanding um, the views of people and how difficult that is to do, yeah. um, but internally and externally. Um, I'm curious more broadly about how you think the world of work um, is changing. You mentioned you've got a huge platform at this point with people that are uh, from that are senior leaders inside organizations all up. Um, give me what you're seeing, what signals you're seeing in terms of um, of how the world of work is is changing, and sure. I'd like to know it from two perspectives, almost like what is the most exciting about the way the world of work is changing and what scares you the most? Um, I think um, I want to go back to like the history of like where we, we even started work like as, as a race, right? If you look at uh, the, the industrial revolution, companies which had the highest amount of workforce were considered to be the biggest companies. Today, mm -hmm. that's not the case. There, there could be a 20 or 100 employee company which could be worth in billion dollars in reality in revenues compared to a large company which has 10,000 employees. So the value uh, created per employee is not a real metric of what it's going to look like. So my, my understanding of how that's going to change is companies are going to focus on their core work and outsource most of the things in the future. Now, that outsourcing could be to human beings or could be to AI. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm pretty optimistic just being in Silicon Valley, meeting so many founders who are building amazing companies around AI, uh, meeting investors who are, who are working on investing into these kind of companies. There are going to be a lot of tasks which are mundane and administrative that are going to go, go away. 
uh, in the next five to 10 years. It could be even shorter, depending on how the technology progresses. So I think uh, my, my view is people are going to focus on core jobs that only a human being can do, um, which, which where you are better than you know an AI can do that. And all the other tasks would be outsourced to other people or maybe a, a, a technology itself within companies outside the company so that's going to be a big shift for us the biggest worry that i have i wouldn't say it's a scare but the worry that i have is a lot of people are going to displace from get displaced from their jobs mm-hmm. um, so it, there are two ways to look at it one is um, how do companies create like these cross-platform learning environments where you can shift from one job to another because your job or your task completely gets automated and the other one is how do we as governments and countries look at that? Yeah. Um, and I think those are the two things. If steps are not taken correctly, you'll see a lot of people losing financially, getting displaced. So that could be those things. And it could be like a slow drip. It is not necessarily going to happen like one day, millions of people lost jobs, but it's going to be like a slow drip. So you wouldn't see the impact short term like right then and there in that moment but that could be like apocalyptic impact like over the next 10 years 20 years i think that's something that people should should really think about um uh job displacement is definitely going to happen if not um just completely losing jobs yeah yeah all right well we'll leave it on that down note but (laughs) (laughs) sorry about that no worries uh it was it was very nice to talk to you today and really uh gained a lot of insights there thanks so much shark Yeah, I appreciate it, Paul. Thank you.